signing orders that you can just confirm. They're either standard uh, orders that you're signing or we talked about them. One of the two. Um, so one meeting to order at 631. Are there any additions or adjustments to the agenda <laughs> Excuse me. One would be a very brief update on where we are on the regional assessor. Okay, so that would be follow-ups number eight. Yep. Regional assessor. Okay. Uh, second would be um, Lamont County Planning Commission appointments. Yep. We'll do that. Should be very quick. We'll do that. Right. Following number six. Okay. okay. And then I just want to weigh in quickly on trail mowing, rail trail mowing. Okay. Uh, the only thing I want to mention about the agenda is that for the executive session, we have it listed at 835, and regardless of where we are in the agenda, we need to start that on time. So we may have, end up having an executive session in the middle of our Okay. Excellent. Let's jump into the executive order. So, um, uh, I'm going to do my best in figuring out what we need to read. Pretty good idea. Uh, so, first up is Stephen Boyation, a tax refund. Jen Burke, Team and Fraternity Oven. Uh, expenses a total of $174.99. Carol Baker, tax refund, $37.63. Seller waste management, recycling, $30.47, of which $16.2 is much. Champlain Valley Equipment, Stump, Jump, Blade, and Blade. For a total of, of six hundred forty dollars and forty cents. Uh, Christine Corbett, tax refund two dollars thirty six cents. Credit card payment for two hundred and one dollars and five cents. Not sure what those are for. Albert and Jane, Alberta and James Cochran, tax refund twenty six point six cents. Comcast for the uh, two hundred forty. A total of two three hundred twenty eight dollars and forty cents with one hundred sixty four point two cents mortgage. Consolidated for Historical Society of one hundred four forty eight. Tax refund of Tommy. Uh, sorry, Edwards Constance one thousand one hundred forty eight dollars and forty four cents. Tax refund to Michael Paul for three hundred two dollars and sixty eight cents. Catalog services to Free Mountain Library. Three pound trailers, bolt, sixty four dollars and ninety five cents. Uh, Ingram, the library room program, two hundred ninety one dollars and fifty four cents. That's a hardware type of uh, battery, uh, hot water. I don't know what I was looking for. That was a big one that's four thousand eight hundred dollars and twenty seven cents. Ladder? Just eat your hand over. Uh, yeah. Um, a shake for $12.71. Spray paint driver kit for $250.29. Glasses of $34.97. A refund for glasses of $44.99. 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 Jonathan Schultz, that um, way, tax refund is 1748. Lamont County Planning Commission, the town appropriation, $1,076. Lamont County Special Investigation, town appropriation, $2,224.48. LWI Metalworks for a tractor fender, um, $53.16. Tax refund to the most victim for $71.76. Uh, a notch sand, winter sand, $4,249.84. A tax refund to follow Patricia Wooden, 
Okay, while we're doing this, um, next agenda item is reviewing and approving minutes for July 8th, 2022. Make a motion to approve. You have a motion to do a second? Second. No second, any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All right. Mark, where'd you go? Watch, watch. Okay, I just have it. Um, any select board issues or concerns? I got one thing, Madam Chair. Yes. I was in uh, Woodstock last week and in the midst of all the contributions that the uh, Rockefellers made to Woodstock, I was leafing through a magazine in my room and uh, I ha happened upon a picture of an honorable selectman from Johnson. And apparently- Is it you? No, it wasn't me. <laughs> I said honorable. Right. <laughs> Apparently, uh, he contributed to a book that his brother was, wrote on the uh, life and times in Woodstock, as well as uh, his dad had wrote a book on the, his upbringing in uh, the Northeast Kingdom. I can't find it. Article right now. You don't need to find it. You've seen it, I'm sure. <laughs> I have it, but I'm okay, but you anyway, guess. guessing. I stole it from my room to bring it to you. Oh, great. So, who is the person, Eric? Duncan Hayes. Ah. That's great, Duncan. We'll look for your picture. Yes, yeah, okay. Okay. find yourself. All right. Uh, next, uh, any other items? Thanks for sharing that, Eric. I'll look forward to looking at your question. In an article, too. In an article? Oh, okay. We should read my brother's book. Uh, uh, I see. I see. Okay. We're going to go buy Duncan's brother's book. Um, Treasurer's report. Did you have anything from Rosemary? Uh, I have one thing from Rosemary. One. We want to come back to that one and have Jason go. All right, Jason. Uh, Hello. Okay. 
than that, we're still uh, on the road. We're, we're over half done. So I'm going to get this now. And we're going to complete it just uh, the rest of it this week. And uh, uh, in this, I had a meeting with uh, Rob Moore today uh, about the Oxlaw grant project. That meeting was good. Uh, I'm going to have a uh, report of the meeting for us. So by the end of next week. Okay, cool. That's your Foxlaw road. Oh, well, maybe I'm you thought what? Yeah. Sorry, the top and your segments are about 300 feet. Gotcha. So segments are about the like six feet. And this is the last. Okay. Any questions for us? I don't believe so. I think Brian put it in. Uh, Brian put his hand. Oh, there was. Yep. Okay. There was a discussion yeah, about ahead. salt sand renting excavator for September and October in his report. And I have a question about um, mowing the roadsides, and this is more a uh, like hopefully the board can plan better and everything uh, just to control invasive species a little bit better. It's too late for this year, but it would be good if we could maybe contract out or something in, in early June before anything goes to seed. Cause as you know, every roadside mower picks up seed and then it scatters it. And there's a lot of invasive species that are just spreading faster than they should be. Um, and that's no fault to anybody that molds roadsides. It's the time of year to do it. But if there was money in the budget next year, and possibly we could get, if you could get some quotes maybe for having that contracted out, because I know you guys are real busy that time of year. Are you asking for quotes now or are you asking for quotes then? Well, I'm, I'm asking for if it could be in, in the mind to hopefully bring back up. I would love to do it in the spring. Uh, I think the, this year because of or our last year's budget for, you know, three or five. Right. But I would love to do it in spring, because when uh, Jacqueline's not leaving, gets in the seed and more of those syrup, it can eventually take it down. Garbage. Poison parsnip is spreading exponentially fast. Its germination is so high, and it grows the seed fast. So maybe that's a good thing to bring up. If you have a list of things you're bringing up in budget season, because town would have to have an idea on a number and see if we could fit it in the budget. Um, I'm sure the Conservation Commission would be pretty happy if invasive species were controlled better, but that's no fault to you guys. Evan, would you think if the mowing is done earlier in the season, it would require a second mowing later on? Or? I believe our town crew would still have to mow it once, but during that busy season, it's not realistic to have them. I mean, unless we want to add a lot of overtime and, and they're using the tractor for different things that time of year. And it would probably be smart to at least have a conversation budget season time. If we could budget hiring out mowing early in the year and then our road crew would do it one more time. Cause that way, if you cut it before anything goes to seed, you're not spreading that seed. Yeah, totally Either that or get a blower for it or something. <laughs> I don't know how, how that would work. Um, go ahead, Mark. Um, I just want to really second what Evan is saying. Um, I've watched poison parsnip just spread across the, the state. And um, if there's anything we can do to mow that before it goes to seed, I mean, it, it'll just... You're really, it's a really good idea, Evan, and I really support you in that. And if there's any way we can do it, it'll really help. Um, it, it isn't, it isn't bad in all of Johnson, but it's coming and it's really not good. Um, I put a note in the March, you know, calendar view, but if you could add it into whatever calendar you use, also that would be good. That we will. We would need budget numbers by then. Yeah. Although next spring would still be on this fiscal year, which the taxpayers have already voted the budget, but we would need to 
think about incorporating it in 2023, 2024? So we don't actually need to know those numbers until we do it next spring because it would apply to the following budgeting cycle. Well, we would need to know the numbers by December when we're doing the budget. We don't need them tomorrow. It'd be no. good if, you, if you're talking to somebody and you can get numbers. That's yeah, all I'm asking. Okay. We'll start early. We can hopefully make some time with them to come out. Yeah, there's no point in doing it unless we get it before it goes to see. So. Well, it has to be mowed either way. Just if we're going to contract it, it well, will I, be. I understand that. But if we, if the intent is to get it before it goes to seed, and that requires hiring it then, I got you. That's different than having that crew do it after the public. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank cool. you. Thanks, Jason. Um, treasure report, Brian? I don't think I have anything for the treasure report. I don't think something else from the Rosemary. Right? Do you have anything about licenses? Okay. Okay. Can I ask Jake one quick question? Yeah. Um, you've got a note on here, receipt the dump trailer. Is that something that is being pulled behind one of the smaller trucks? Yeah. It's it not. Was, yeah, it was something that we uh, approved while we were working. And finally, I mean, okay. yeah. but it's, it's not a dump body for. It's a trailer with a dump on it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, plan purchases. We've got one plan purchase to show up in your supplement uh, that's purchasing an additional $10,000 worth of sand. Um, if you recall, we had a little bit of a discussion about reallocating some of the money that we had dedicated to salt uh, in the current year budget to more sand. And this is reflective of that. We can spend about another $10,000 on sand. We'll get the money by underspending a little bit on salt. But that's this fiscal year. That's this current fiscal year. What is, well, we're not, we are now in budget fiscal year 23. We are after July 1st, which yes. we are now in fiscal year 23. So what yes. budget are you talking about? What fiscal year 23. 23. So the, the plan would be to underspend the salt budget by 10,000 bucks? Yep. Maybe because there was so much salt that? left from last year and they purchased out the full contract. So the shed's full. Yeah, I was mainly looking at the say perhaps we have all last year, I switched to Brian. And last year the sand pile was put up by just like on fifteen and twenty hundred line items that were similar. Uh, we hit that a little bit, because uh, we last year we overspent quite a bit on uh, sand. Uh, so we had dedicated a couple other line items and some other resources to Again, some of the sand we thought it was going to last a little bit longer than it did. Uh, I think Jason was correct because he was giving some about how long it would last. But it was still very helpful to have a good large stockpile of sand available for use. So we want to do that again. Um, and we think that we don't have to draw money from a lot of different places. We think that we can do that again, just drawing a little bit of money from a place that we saved money last year. How, how many yards you got put up right now? Uh, well, ton wise is what I've been measuring by all the pits with my tons now. Uh, right now we're thirty-four thousand dollars hauled in. That, that was not counting this week's slips uh, from the from the auction yeah, as of today because they hauled today and they hauled last week. But the uh, you know, uh, not doing slips yet. We're not having. Uh, we put up this about three quarters done. And uh, we're just in the process of capping it now, but we put up 5,000 yards a year. Winter. And then, like with this last winter, when we don't get much snow, but we get rain, it's freezing rain. We'll get more 
our sanity and go to the soul. But we didn't go through, we went through the same thing the year before. So we keep track of every load that goes out. And each truck averages around 130 loads for all three trucks. Can you think you, you're about three quarters? We're about three quarters done. Right, this time. So my question would be, if um, if we're in the current budget year, which we are, mm -hmm. Christmas year, which we are, I understand the concept of trying to add it, but I also understand that um, if it's 10,000 bucks that we can save in return to the taxpayers, that's good too. So my question is, do we really need this extra 10,000 bucks to get you to a full 5,000 yards? Uh, if you drive down the sand file at, at this point, we don't have the whole top half. But there's not money in the that's already budgeted or allocated to Just fill that pile. The money that was budgeted is off like twenty five. Um, it's off half twenty five hundred to five thousand yards, and the money that's budgeted is for half that. It's usually half is pulled. From the pit. Last year it was pulled from the pit due to other circumstances. This year, Emsha and Manpower haven't been able to get I don't, I can't pull it from the pit, so I have to go. Answer the question. Okay. Any other questions? Any motions? Do you need a motion for this one? Are you still getting that from the 10,000? Yeah. What, what were you saying? I, I, I asked Jason if he was still getting that same from Menage. Well, the board had a question about where Menage's pit was located. And uh, we thought that it was out towards uh, Morrisville. Well, kind of area it's actually in. Even if we're here, we're traveling 15 at all. Yeah, we didn't have to deal with the traffic on 15 or the road construction. It's also much closer than that area further down through 15. So, we need a motion on that. I, I would move uh, to authorize this spending of a large purchase. Uh, $10,000, or I guess a reallocation of funds in the budget of $10,000 from salt to sand. Okay, we have a motion to have a second. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Mark your aye. You're on mute. Okay. Um, that should be a button to you. That's okay. Thank you. I'm an eye on that. Perfect. Thank you. You were too. Yes. Okay. Eyes have it. Thanks, Jason. Uh, next up, committees and volunteers. All right. So first up, we have uh, Green Mountain ATV Club and some proposed improvements that they would like to make on Common uh, Oliver. They're describing your packet. This is the improvements themselves are something that we would normally fall under uh, Jason's purview as the public works supervisor. Uh, and these are pretty ordinary road improvements that we typically would approve for a class four road. What's a little bit different about these is because on packet page 12, uh, Uh, resolution of commitment from the municipality. So this is a resolution that asks the select board uh, to commit to uh, ensuring that, that the Green Mountain ATV Club has continued use of uh, 
of the trail improvements of Merrick Crest Wednesday first. Uh, I did talk to Spencer, uh, but he was not able to make the meeting tonight. So if we have any questions, they're happy to try and answer them. Uh, they understand that you know, this might be a little bit of back and forth before the board's ready to sign off on I don't know if anybody has any thoughts or if you want to get into it. Madam um, Chair, I guess I'm just fully supporting the uh, ATV car and investments we make into our highways and appreciate that they come to support to get the permits that they put. Uh, what I'm a little bit struggling with is uh, the resolution of commitment. To me, the select board not commit a future board or something. Uh, so that's where this would be a little bit problematic. While I do support it, and as long as I was on the board, I would support them having access to it. I would have troubles uh, supporting the resolution. I'd have to write it differently. It's like a annually renewing contract without notice of termination or something. <clears throat> that would be that would be the only way to do it is to have some kind of a something where it doesn't hold a future select board to something that we can't do. And it needs to be filled out. Like the town highway number is not there. Yeah. Um, trail name's not there, and the useful life of an investment is not defined in years. So if those were cleaned up, then it was a... If we, to Eric's point, if we made that useful life of improvement one year, that would not connect a future board? Well, we could make it 10 years. Um, as long as it was automatically renewing without notice of termination or something. Similar to what we do with our contracts when we sign them for IT support. Those are three-year contracts, but we can't hold the future board to it. So they're just automatically renewing without notice. They That's can do this. very thing. different than, I mean, this is talking about a town highway. It's not talking about... But they couldn't use a similar... Avenue. It's not talking about a service they're providing or a asset they own. It's them putting money into our asset and wanting to protect their investment. I can understand why they're you know asking totally for this because they're making quite an investment, uh, and I mean they've had access to Cotton Hall for twenty years. And I don't perceive that they wouldn't have it in the future, but. I just, I'm troubled signing on to something that we can't hold a future select board. Currently, we can't because it's a class four segment of road, and the state allows access to all ATVs on class four road segments. But if the state changed their mind, well, then we would be in effect. They did change the law a few years ago where now it does require count. It has to be uh, on the cloud. Last four, I believe, and the account is this is yeah. And you don't do that. Your thoughts? I do a couple. Yeah. Um, one is to be sure that these improvements are actually taking place within the highway right away, and not. Have you looked at it, Jason? Yeah, they're, they're in the last four. Everything is, is with it. Yeah, so, they're trying to make it better so they can stay within the parameters and the one sort of the greater wash for the trying to keep compliance and sort of more parameters. And that was going to be one of my other questions. Would, would the improvements that they're planning be maybe this is Brian question? Would, are any of those located in identified segments of the road under our municipal general? Highways permit? Yeah, there's 
Well, I don't believe that it goes to address any current problems, but it, it is work to help us avoid those problems. Uh, so right now that work is not within an identified uh, high erosion area in, in our municipal general plan. It have? is on an identified hydrologically connected road segment. Uh, but I don't believe that on that road segment, I don't believe that we currently have gully erosion would require us to address it. Uh, but it is an area that's hydrologically connected, so it's something that we could have, we could be required to go up and do a project there in the future. This would shore that up and help us avoid that kind of expense in the future. Somebody not throw. Sure. Or something behind it, but it took out the water and caused a little bit of erosion from the grass to They just want to address it so it doesn't erode more so you can use that as a trail again. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm totally supportive of the, of the concept of making improvements. That are, are needed or necessary. I, I I do have the same concern that Eric has about um, committing a, one board to something that a new board might not agree to. And this agreement specifically says that if we uh, reverse that decision, then the town becomes liable for the costs for the improvements to this. And I don't. That language bothers me too. I don't. You know, we're, we're in the middle of talking about cha potential changes to the ATV ordinance. What would happen? Like, it's probably not going to happen, but what would happen if, if our ordinance said that they couldn't access County Hall? Then, then we would be in the position of having to reimburse NASA, you know, for any costs that they, you know, that they put into it. You know, I, I don't think that's a good position for us to be in. I also think that we, probably should have asked the Conservation Commission to uh, weigh in on this since it's all, with, I as I understand, it's all within the Gomo lot and prior boards at least have kind of tasked the Conservation Commission with the general management of the Gomo property. Um, so I think it would have been nice or courteous at a minimum to, uh, you know, solve the uh, thoughts or opinions of the Conservation Commission on this. I, we do have that opportunity. So the, the project is committed to start. So we'd like to share it with the Conservation Commission. Mark? Um, I have similar concerns to Eric and um, Duncan, and I'd add in that. Um, I mean, supposing that we end up the citizens of the town vote to limit ATV access on class four. Does that mean we um, end up having to pay the club back also? Um, and I'd, I'd like to hear again for a fact that this is only happening within the right way of the road because the schematic seems to look like it's going to one side of the road or the other. And Jason, you've been up there and seen exactly where they're going to do this? I have, yeah. And it's going to be in the right of way. Yes, it is. Thank you. Yeah, we should have them, like, if this is an attachment to it, if they could just put lines instead of a separate, because you don't have a copy. It has the yellow line, it's the area of work. Yep. But it's, to Mark's point, it's to the side of the road. It's actually on top of the road. Um, do you want this? Um, I think Brian will likely follow up on this anyway. So Brian, do you, so right now I'm hearing um, the last above certification versus be it further resolved that the town understands the failure to fulfill this uh, may result in, well, in funds returned essentially. That like the board is hesitant to, I think we have unanimous support on that one. Yes, yes, Evan. Okay, so that one we're not comfortable with. Um, the 
two paragraphs up where it reference, sorry, two paragraphs up where it references the continued use. Um, we, there's a suggestion that we could have an annual renewal. Um, that's Evan's suggestion. Eric, I think I heard you being supportive of that. Yeah. Are you supportive of that? I'd be a lot happier if we or whatever board looked at for this every year. An annual. And Mark, are you supportive of annual? Okay. Okay. So then there's the annual there. Um, and then to Evan's point, just above that, where it has references to the roads, like that needs to be filled in. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, maybe um, pushing this over to the conservation committee to get feedback. There's going to be time between our next meeting and this anyway. Anything else? Do you want to see pictures? I, I trust that what you're saying is accurate, um, Jason. I, you know, when I was looking at the map, I couldn't really tell. There is a section of the old road that goes down a really steep ravine, and that section got completely washed out. And that's what he was saying. He said. There's a short section in there that I guess that's technically the way out of it. I guess I'd have to look into it. I'm trying to remember exactly what they were talking about. Yeah. What he told me to do was fixing the water by installing the infrastructure. Yeah. So that section I'm talking about, if they, I, I think at one point that they had sort of moved the trail up to the upper side. Yeah, they moved, I know where you're, I know where you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, and, and that would be outside, yes. that would be on the prop, on the Gomo property. So if they're working in that section, then I, I think it's perhaps a little bit different conversation uh, than working within that existing area. They're just repairing water bars. How much material do they even need? Because we do have a small amount of money budgeted for maintenance on class four roads. And I can't speak for the board, but if there's somewhere we could meet in the middle where we just dump a couple loads of material off and they do the work. Maybe they don't need this agreement. And we're fulfilling work on class four roads and making sure it's done properly and not tying up a ton of man hours. But that would have to be a board decision, not me. Are there any areas where a culvert would be more appropriate than a water bar? Where they're, where they're looking? If they could get the depths. Yeah. The only reason I asked the question is the that money that's been budgeted in the past has often been to provide culverts to people living on class four roads so that they could, you know, we provide the culvert, they put it in, that kind of thing. But we haven't had, I guess we really haven't had that request for a few years. Quite some time. I think I've got the follow up for the ADV fund. I'll share the current plans with conservation. Uh, President Lab has mm -hmm. updates to it, but I don't think the lovely was going for it. I think the project is the project will probably be what the project is. Okay. You know, I don't know I almost would uh, make the suggestion to to get the whole resolution. Period. Yes, yeah, yeah. we're marking it up that much, we're getting rid of We're marking things. up that much, but at the end of the day. It's the ordinance that's going to say what is allowable. And as difficult as it is to change an ordinance, whatever we end up with a 
the, the current ordinance we've had for 15 years or more, if we change and, and write a new ATV ordinance, it will probably be here for 15 more years. So the, the biggest uh, safety net is the ordinance. And, and that does govern over a select board. No select board is able to uh, authorize or, or take away roads that are not identified in the ordinance. So yeah. That might be a suggestion. You could, don't even submit the I'll talk to you Thank you. All right. Next up, uh, we have a discussion around the possibility of a permanent housing shelter uh, being located in Johnson. Uh, we have folks here to speak to that. You want to take it away, or do you want to? Take it away. Okay. Should we take it away? Should I say it? Um, hold on one second. Let me just ask. Hey, Mark, can you hear the audience? Uh, not real well. If they would use this, the microphone, that would be better. <laughs> Anywhere, kind of in the center front row, should be possible. Yeah, yeah, that sounds perfect. <laughs> Can we just keep talking? Mark, oh, Mark? <laughs> they want to mute you, Mark. Hi, <laughs> Mark. He can't see you. Oh, I, well, I don't know. Right. Do you All want right. to introduce yourselselves? Yes, I yeah, will start. Um, I'm Kim Ansberger, and I'm the executive director of the Memorial Community House. I'm Jim Lovinsky, I'm the executive director of the Memorial Housing Partnership. Also, giving you a hard time, Mark, by the way, because you're wondering who it was. <laughs> <laughs> we're at we're college people. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Stuart Bay, CEO of the Moya Health Department. Which is also OHP. I like to call them OHP Square. Because <laughs> they're both OHP. Anyway. And LHP um, meaning Lamoille Partner Housing. Hmm? LHP. Yeah, Lamoille Health Housing Partnership and Lamoille Health Partners. 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 So we got two of uh, 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 so, uh, <laughs> we were A little slow here, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Just trying to start off with jokes, you know. But anyway. What do you do with your web page? <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I'll start real quick um, just to do a little background on the Royal Community House. I don't know how many of you know about us, but we've been around for almost five years. We're currently located in Hyde Park at what's called what we call the Yellow House, which is owned by the Sheriff's Department, the Mayor of Adler. Um, we operate a warming shelter out of there that's open from November to April. Um, Pre pandemic, we would close the doors uh, in the morning and help people over to Morrisville and reopen when the pandemic hit, everything changed. Uh, we opened our doors 24-7, and then we also expanded our um, our work efforts and started serving people who were staying in hotels through the state of Vermont's general assistance program. So we expanded a lot, <laughs> um, managing four locations instead of one. And this showed us the actual need in our county for support for those experiencing homelessness. So we went from serving about 35 people a season to in 2021, we served 261 people, and 58 of those people were children. Um, so that's a huge, <laughs> huge difference, right? Um, and what was the number of kids? 58, 58 children in 2021. That's how many people that we um, did outreach to in the hotels and our shelter. So, um, and I and other professionals in this field don't believe that COVID caused that increase. It's more that the services were more available to everybody. The eligibility to access the hotels was loosened and therefore people accessed it. So now everyone who needed it was able to access it. So we were able to actually get a, a clear picture of the need. So now that we know what the need is, we're responding by trying to find a site to create a year round shelter facility so we can support people every day of the year, not just November through April um, because people are homeless in the summer too. So, Johnson is one of the locations we're looking at. It's, we don't have a site specifically locked down yet, but it is one of the towns that we're exploring. And we're bringing the concept to you today so we can just have this open dialogue. We can you know, hear any concerns. We can just have this continuing conversation over time as we you know, narrow down the location so we can be really transparent about our process. We don't want to like, you know, show up <laughs> a month before we start something and be like, surprise. We want to make sure that we have community input as we go along. Um, so that's a little bit of background. 
Um, what we're doing now, we've partnered with the LHPs <laughs> to provide a, to, to create a vision for like a holistic, um, multi, I don't know, multi level kind of approach to uh, bringing shelter. So this vision includes shelter beds. Um, right now in Hyde Park, we only have 10 beds and we're hoping to have 10, 20. So we want to increase the amount of beds, um, but we, a big part of our vision is creating a community center where we provide services, some of which would be medical, which is why we have Stuart May. Um, the other services would be the same kind of things that we do in our shelter now, but bigger, so like housing navigation, and we could have office spaces where we have partners from the world, kind of health, behavioral health, you know, higher ability for employment search, you name it. You know, we'd have those office spaces for those for service providers to come and provide services. Um, and those services, the big key element of this is that they would be open to all of Johnson, not just our shelter guests. So um, we, we, you know, we recognize that Johnson does have a high poverty level and that the access to services is limited here. So we're hoping that our project can bring services, expand them out of Morrisville into an area where they're needed. And, you know, it'd be great if they were in every town, but <laughs> we can't take that on. Um, so hopefully we can help that vision will help enhance um, the services available to Johnson, the Johnson community. And along with that, we'll also be bringing a lot of jobs. <laughs> um, you know, we operate at 24 seven capacity at our seasonal shelter right now. And we have 11 to 12 staff members for those six months. So if we're doubling our, our um, beds, we'll probably be doubling the staff. So that's like 20 jobs that we'd be bringing um, on our side of the shelter work. And then the third part of it would be hopefully if we have the right property and the right, you know, all the pieces work well, we have, um, <laughs> sorry, um, we have a transitional housing program too, where there is actual transitional or permanent housing that we help people into. So, you know, the shelter is there for when the emergency hits, um, someone doesn't have anywhere to go, they can stabilize, they can get connected to resources. And then we have somewhere to, to try and move them out into a stable place to live. Ooh, talk fast, sorry. <laughs> so great. if you want to now you can just you can talk. As Kim mentioned, um, the vision that we have here was really that holistic or whole person approach, which is what we do at Lemoyne Health Partners. It's more than just that medical intervention. It's talking about employment, physical wellness, um, food, and safety, uh, and such. So um, two years ago, when I became CEO and, and came to this county, one of the things that we noticed is for the western part of the county, so if you will, from High Park all the way out to Waterville, Waterville excuse me, access to services is very limited. A lot of that has to do with just there are not providers or those uh, services available in the western towns. Um, so as we started to improve the health outcomes for the western part of the county, we did look at Johnson. Johnson's very attractive geographically uh, for hitting a lot of those towns. Um, and last year, did a contract with the Lemoya North School District to start to provide the core services, so behavioral health, oral health, and pediatric services in the school system. And this past February, started providing those services at Johnson Elementary which in the first couple of months before the end of the school year, um, in total touched over 50 students that did not have any type of general medical home. And what I mean is they hadn't seen a pediatrician in over a year, they hadn't seen a dentist in over a year, um, and they hadn't um, been able to access mental health services uh, in over a year outside of what the counselor could do in the school. So with that, um, if the student body is not accessing the services, there is a high probability that the rest of the family is not. So as Kim mentioned, um, we're looking to partner to jointly look for real estate um, here in Johnson if we're uh, successful to bring those services here. One of the things during COVID that we did find out is as uh, individuals had a stable place to stay, it made it easier to bring those services to those individuals um, and to help them navigate to get uh, the proper resources, which are both medical and some of those non-medical. For the 
in touch with the folks over at Capstone for housing and energy assistance. So that's the model that uh, we would bring here. Um, both our organizations have a um, strong belief in supporting the community. We talked about those individuals finding economic empowerment so they can improve their health outcomes. Uh, we would look for uh, this community and the surrounding towns to draw those uh, individuals. Right now, all of those services that I talked about, uh, folks have to travel to either Morrisville or to our snow campus to uh, see those services. So when we talk about transportation being a high barrier, right, right the likelihood of getting to Johnson and High Park over the north is not consistent. Uh, so in order to bring this um, project, uh, once we're able to find a site, uh, back when Jim's team uh, comes in, so I'll explain a little bit about his role and how the Moya Housing Partnership is able to uh, bring those developers um, and investors to actually uh, build the facility. Jim? Yeah, that's how it works. So the Moya Housing Partnership um, is the local affordable housing developer for the Moya County of Hardwick. We have uh, just about 300 units that we manage um, across the county. We're constantly trying to find new sites to, to develop more permanent housing, permanent affordable housing. In Johnson, um, we have the Johnson Community site, which is right across from the elementary school. Um, and uh, that property is um, has kind of a high turnover rate. And sometimes I think it's because of the lack of ability to have services local with some some type of taxation. Um, so our our goal in this would be that when we find a site we have access to uh, funders uh, the funding mechanisms to bring uh, the finance to bear to uh, do acquisition rehab or new construction in the case. Um, our Housing is mostly permanent housing. Although in our all of our new construction, our new sites now, we're building in units that are set aside uh, for folks coming out of homelessness or in the danger of homelessness. We partner with folks on the service agencies that, uh, that we work with to provide wraparound services for those folks so they can be successful. So uh, one thing would be someone being finding their way to a shelter, getting the services they need there, finding their way into a transitional housing uh, situation where they can really get stabilized, get a job or whatever the case may be, um, get help to understand how to be a good uh, tenant, resident, if you will, and then we can work them into permanent housing. Um, with our goal being obviously to bring the shelter out of business, although I'm not sure that's a possibility. Where things are right now. Um, I think that what I found in partnering with this is that there is some idea that there's not local homelessness, and there is in every community in the county. And uh, a lot of people are finally realizing that there really is a housing crisis right now that we are experiencing. Um, there are not very many. Uh, Metro units available, in fact, not even that many um, single family homes available for the missing middle of people right now. So, our job has been primarily to try and find appropriate places to um, build new housing units um, wherever we can. Our criteria, because there's a consolidated plan that the state uses, is focus on downtowns because. Uh, downtown development in, in Vermont is the traditional kind of development role. And that's where we'd like to support our communities is by putting the uh, support in the um, To do multi-family development, we really need municipal water, municipal sewer, uh, because a lot of our folks don't drive. Walkability, access to services, access to shopping or banking or whatever people need. To get by. So that would be our role in this is to support these guys and support you in, in that development sequence. Uh, oftentimes we ask for money from the Vermont Community Development Program 
which requires a select board to sign on to request those dollars to fund the sources. So you might hear from us again. So yes, I'm good. So the questions. Let's go first. Um, so you referred to the Yellow House and in Hyde Park. Is, would your goal in Johnson be to replace that with a facility here that would have 20 bed capacity? Yeah, yeah, we would be replacing that. We, we would just no longer rent it from the sheriff. And as far as the uh, medical services or the broad range of services available, would that be limited to the population, the homeless population that you are serving or open to the wider community? No, it would be open to the wider community. Uh, we like the geographic location of Johnson, because besides Johnson, we believe we can also then attract those residents of Jeffersonville, uh, Belvedere, Eden. So it would be open to all. It just makes some sense in um, the current environment to partner in a quote unquote real estate transaction than uh, looking to wholly facilitate a facility. And with regard to population served, I'm, I'm sure you're all well aware of the, the services currently being provided by Jenna's Promise. Is there, is there a natural Nexus between what they're doing and what you're doing, and has that been investigated? Yeah, we've um, there is a bit of crossover in the people that we serve. There are sometimes people that we can refer to them when they can refer to us. It's not always this exact same population. Our shelter um, doesn't require people to be sober in order to access the shelter. Um, it's what we call a low barrier shelter, um, whereas the recovery home. We have to be in recovery to be doing that. So there is some crossover in that. Um, but yeah, and we are having, you know, we, we reach out to teachers and we try to have conversations about what our goals are. And that's something that we can make sure to, you know, distinguish as we as we proceed to make sure that we're not stepping on toes or duplicating services, but moving together. I got just one, one last observation, I guess. Um, Johnson's been involved in a number of studies over the course of years about um, finding, you know, the solution to the needs of um, low-income housing. Uh, and one of the barriers has always been, at least the perception locally, that Johnson already is serving a lot of low-income housing, um, you know, in terms of the number of rental units, et cetera. Um, and one of the one of the things that I think has been thought about is um, is there any ability to turn some of that permanent housing that you referred to, Jim, into owner occupied, such as you know the Champlain Housing Trust does in, in Burlington? Are there is there even the concept of dedicating a certain number of units that are created or established? into owner occupied over the course of time uh, in, in that kind of model or? Um, I have not explored that personally if you're talking about like condominium wise. Um, we do not in our, our organization at the Home Ownership Center, but we work with Campaign Housing Trust downstream um, because they do have home ownership centers. So yeah, that's it's possible to I just wonder why you haven't really looked at Morrisville as a place to house. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm wondering why you haven't looked more at Morrisville as a place to build a shelter where all of the services are at Morrisville, where transportation is available. You really, as you pointed out, you lack a lot of that. And to try to replicate and build all of that at Johnson to support a shelter. Why don't you just put the shelter in Morrisville where all the services are already available? Okay. Uh, my two things are one is that these guys would like and, and, and other service providers 
would really like to be able to bring their services to another firm, other parts of the firm, so that folks from Johnson right now have to travel to Morrisville to access those services. So if we can bring those services to your community, that is the only thing that can Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Morrisville right now, building all kinds of new housing everywhere. Um, they, to do, to do a shelter in Morrisville is very limited. Um, I think it's very intense. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. The zoning in Morrisville restricts the shelters. I think you want to do a shelter is restricted to one part of town. And then they, they added another layer, other layers to that. One is going to do a dev at the staff point four seven. Did you hear that, Margo? Eight beds stacked twenty four seven. And our shelter is staffed twenty four seven, so that's not a complicated issue. But I think there's some zoning in general is just limits the ability for us to, to build the kind of project we want. Um, and that was my first thing. My second thing was kind of along what you said about bringing the services here. And you had said, like, why build all the services just to have a shelter? But it's really more to serve the community. It's not just like when we talk about the medical stuff made for all of Johnson, so much services. So it wouldn't be like our community center is only for our guests, but it would be for anyone in Johnson, you know, and that's, that's kind of like a computer lab with like Wi Fi. So people can do job searching and maybe a job coach on the culture. So, and if we talk about transportation too, which we part of our vision is to hopefully purchase a van um, and maybe work with some other organizations to create a shuttle route to two different areas. But um, if there is no transportation, it feels like even more important that we can bring services here so people can access them because they can't get to them. But, um, and that's kind of the case everywhere you know, besides Morrisville, right? So, because uh, everywhere is. Besides Morrisville, not Morrisville. <laughs> so, like, we we're going to want to integrate services into our shelter model, regardless of where we are, um, because being in Morrisville seems really challenging um, because of the zoning and what's available to be so best shelter. And just to, to add, um, as I mentioned, we're coming to the western part of the county to bring those services. So, as we've been doing that, Jim and, and Kim contacted me and said, hey, if we found a facility that we could use all that space, is there an opportunity to, to partner? So we're still bringing those services, um, you know, happy to follow up and provide our statistics. But as the Vermont Department of Health looks at health vulnerability um, by town, by county, and all, um, Johnson, Belvedere, Waterville, are our towns in our county that actually rank the highest, which is not a good thing, um, as access and um, also our socioeconomics are working against those individuals to actually be able to get to where most of all the health care services are actually located in this county, which is that stone more still order of unfortunate. So we're still coming. Hopefully, um, it would be nice if we can jointly find a property that works for both and consolidate there because as I mentioned during COVID and some of the state programs um, to deal with some of the homeless during the COVID we found that if people have a stable place even if it is only for six months we're able to deploy our health coaches um, and our health navigators to help bring all of those resources to those individuals so they can actually uh, start to maximize their health status. Um, it, to your question earlier about Jenna's Promise and Jenna's House, currently the Moira Health Partners does support Jenna's House uh, in a couple of different ways. One, through uh, they have a provider that is actually there providing some of the services, um, and one of our uh, teams within the Moira Health Partners actually backs up that uh, private individual. Um, two is part of our mission, we look to reinvest in communities. Um, so some of the uh, coffee roasting that, that we're doing over there, we're buying some of our uh, coffee products from them as well. 
um, and actually working with them now to bring them into a full uh, a health collaborative that we have where uh, we could you know, really start to share information and help coordinate to maximize those uh, health status. Just on another note, the, you know, the community has invested a lot into this, Jenna's promise, and it's a very vulnerable population. Population that would be served by the, the uh, homeless shelter. Would that be detrimental to the, or could that put some of the uh, Jenna's promise people in jeopardy? Before you answer that, I have the same question Eric has, but phrased slightly differently which is, are there studies out there about the proximity of homeless shelters that are not dry homeless shelters to recovery centers and um, you know, what that success rate is? I'm not sure about studies, but that's a great thing for me to look into, so thank you. Um, but yeah, I would say that it's, it's, it's such a hard question to answer to because, you know, there's going to be exposure to people who are using, regardless of if those people are experiencing homelessness or not. So if someone, you know, that's part of a recovery program, um, you know, goes out into town and, you know, meets somebody that they know, they can do that regardless of if they're in shelter or not. And we see that with people that we have in shelter, who are in the recovery, you know, we're not a recovery program. And then, like, when we used to close during the day, we have people who would go out into town and come back and then obviously be under the influence of something. Um let's see. <laughs> if that's where we that's where how we operate. Like if someone's behavior is not safe, that's what we ask them to leave. But um we can tell, you know, so it's it's really hard to like pinpoint where exactly um that source is coming from and it is common to align substance misuse with the homeless population and there's a reason for that. You know, people who are experiencing homelessness have undergone a lot of trauma and they are living in crisis. Their their brain is in a survival mode where they can't really plan long term and they're doing what they can to survive, which sometimes is harmful because it's using substances or you know doing other things that are not good for themselves or community. Um, which is again why it's so important that we have a shelter that's year round because that gives the people a chance to stabilize. When we close every six months, it's like restarting for everybody. And, and like what Stu said, when you, when you have access to a certain place for a certain amount of time, you can get that support and eventually move out of that survival mode because they're working with something. I feel like I'm not answering, and that's not what I meant to do. I'm sorry. Um, I'm just saying that the, there's access to these substances from people who are housed as well in this, in this community and in other communities. So I, I don't have the research to back up my, my hunch, but I don't, I don't think that the shelter specifically will increase the risk um, when, there's, when that issue is um, an issue at every income level. Honestly. I'm just gonna follow up because I feel like this is a good segue to my, one of my other questions and a couple others, then I'll go back to you. But my other question is, you know, um, I don't know you, any of you really. Yeah. And I tend to say what I think usually. Um, and like from a board perspective, from my personal view of a board's perspective, our job is to protect our residents, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess I have two questions. One is how many Johnson residents, and I understand they're homeless, so residents is a loose term, but how many people identify as belonging to Johnson? that you've seen come through the doors in the past year or so? That's one part of my question. And the other part of my question is um, in terms of people coming into the Johnson community, if you were to have a uh, housing, temporary housing on Main Street and you did have to turn people away, what does that mean to Johnson? We already have that risk situation, by the way, with Jenna's house. Yeah. So we also would be compounding that in theory with the homeless shelter. So I don't have any hard data on how many people are from Johnson. Um, so I can't answer that like accurately. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that, and it's so hard to look at the homeless population because they are moving around often so much and it's just 
And I don't want to put the call on the spot. He's a drug manager. He might have a lot of issues. I think she does a lot of intakes. A little bit. Um, <laughs> I think that it's a little bit of 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 a from school come for our doors. Yeah. I've seen parents of students come for our doors. It's, it's tough. It's tough to see the it, it really is. I, I can also guarantee that every single person in this room probably has something to talk about. Um, it's, yeah. Families. 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 Um, yeah. Family members, people that you would expect to observe. Yeah, another week for one night, whether it be for a week, three months, they will I'd like to note too just on that that like we're talking a lot about like the substance use issue, but this is not like all people with substance use issues. Like we see people that are 18 aging out of foster care. We yes. see people that are 75, 80 years old who can, you know, that really their level of need is way above what we can provide because they need, you know, physical assistance with like going to the bathroom and things like that that we're not trained to do. Right. Um that, but there's nowhere else for them to go. So, you know, I see us as kind of like catching the people that kind of fall through every other other um, service that don't they don't qualify or you know. Um, but yeah, and I yeah, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have an actual answer for the data on Johnson. What was the second part of your question? I forgot. Um, it was the data on Johnson, but then what happens if they do get turned away? So we do have. Um, we actually have more funding this year. For, we get funded through the Office of Economic Opportunity for our work through the Hot Grant Housing Opportunity Program. Um, and we just started, we're starting this year this thing called Divergent, where when someone comes in, we try to first divert them from shelter to see if there's anywhere they can go. Like maybe they have family out of state, we can pay 200 bucks to get them there so they can be stabilized. So that's one of the new options that we're bringing to shelter. Is trying to either divert people from shelter, like we're gonna go through that with every person to make sure that we're <laughs> limiting, I don't wanna say limiting access to shelter, but really making sure people that access shelter really need it so, so that it is their actual last resort. And if there are other resorts, we can help get them there um, or rapidly exit them within two weeks. So that would hopefully open up beds. So that's one part of that. The second part is that if someone is not, like if we're full or if they're not allowed to access our shelter because of past behavior or if there's a conflict with another shelter guest, there's, there's a bunch of reasons someone might not be able to access shelter. We do have a whole shelter network for the state and we do, and there are ways where we can either see if they're eligible for the GA program through hotels. Um, if they're not, we could possibly also pay for a hotel room for them for a couple of nights while we try to help them figure out a different place to go. Um, but we, you know, we do our best to try to find somewhere else to go if they weren't able to access the, the room. Yeah, okay. And when it comes to the recovery, house, Jennifer promise, you know, if they, they have to say no, we'll be right down the road. <laughs> and they can send them down to us if we, if we end up here. Just, just a little spin Fair on enough. <laughs> I, I think it would be some housing data that's a little bit eye opening. To, to Kim's point, not everybody with homelessness has a drug and alcohol problem or yes, something like that, of that nature. Pre um, pandemic, we used to carry a, a waiting list of right around 200 applications that we would be going through as we would have vacancies come up. So we might have, we might have anywhere from a dozen to two dozen vacancies a month as people who they might find another apartment somewhere else closer to the job. They might buy a home. They're moving out with somebody. Um, that was pre-pandemic. Now we go forward a couple of years. Where we're at now, at the, at the beginning of June, end of May, beginning of June, we had 531 active applications, waiting list. Well, people who have filled out applications and are looking for a place to live. Um, and we had seven turnovers. And that's an, an incredible number that none of us expected to see. Um, we get calls from people who are desperate. 
uh, people who have been sometimes living in a home with their family that they've been renting for 10 years or 20 years. And someone now has moved, has bought the house because they're cash in the real estate market, right? And they're saying, we're going to find some place else to live because we're going to take over the house. In some cases, they're turning them into airplanes just exacerbating exacerbate it um, and making it worse. Um, and we're, we're seeing more and more of that. And a lot of these numbers are just because people can't find homes. They're just not available. The rental market is happening. And their rents are going up. So it's real what you're hearing about tonight. Let's find out as much as we can. Or to make sure we're partnering to get people services where they live, wherever possible in their home, because housing is out there. Um, people who need someplace stable to live. Um, we're building a house in Marshville, it's a bus station right around the corner. And there's two guys sleeping in homes all day long because they've got no place else to go. They've got no help, they've got nobody helping them. So that's where we're at. And it's it's not it's not Johnson's problem, it's not Morrisville's problem, it's all of our problem. Every community has the same issue. Um, and we're reaching out because we know we need to work together as a family as communities to take care of. Our so okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Sure. I share a lot of the similar views with the rest of the board. Um as for services, uh, medical services, there was a, a discussion that we had with Floyd Neese and Dennis Thomas about possibly getting a health clinic here. So there may be a little bit of duplication or competition to that, um, or maybe you're already working with the Dennis Promise folks yeah, on that. I mean, so, so it's, well, I, I it's think not a, that, um, probably almost a year and a half ago initially when uh, Northern Vermont University was looking potentially off road the McClellan building. Um, both uh, at the time Floyd was executive director for Lamoya uh, Family Center, uh, along with Lamoya Health Partners, Greg Petro, who we were jointly looking at purchasing that building. That did not happen because of various bond issues uh, with the state, which now I believe NDU has the path clear to only rent the to sell that asset because it was tied up with revenue bonds. Um, separate of that, uh, currently, um, we are in discussions uh, with Greg on the subway building that he has purchased um, to obtain part of that building uh, for us to bring some medical services uh, to Johnson. We don't have uh, access to that full building, so we still have a requirement for all the services we're looking to bring to the rest of the park of the county for additional space. Okay. It kind of does. Um, and another thing, just as we were talking about substance use, um, it's no secret to any taxpayer of this town in protecting the residents and the taxpayers. Our largest expense is emergency services. Um, and there was a lot of back and forth about substance use in this particular community. Um, not everybody is, but if that were to add 50% or double our sheriff's budget or something like that, the taxpayers would actually be funding the homeless shelter for all of the services that it takes up out of the taxpayer's base, but they wouldn't be knowingly doing that, I guess. Um, is there any plan as you're trying to provide a whole kit and caboodle, if you will, of actually supporting the emergency services, or is the plan to just have the taxpayers put the bill for that? So I just want to make sure I understand. Are you saying that the emergency services would increase? I'm would saying if, if, they did, if they did, is that being thought about? Because that would be... A, Every parcel in this town. Um, not very, not too frequently. Um, so it's close right now. Well, right now, when we're open, 
you're talking about police ambulance and fire would be the dispatch, three patrol. Yeah. dispatch patrol dispatch okay. patrol so i just speak a little bit to that so last year in the six months that we were open and we had ems come twice and once was a was COVID related and once was not um and i think these came three times maybe in the whole six months we were open and we have seen a decrease in yes yeah. in in needing we, to call ems since we've opened 24 7. yeah so we, when we were closer today we try not to call. we we <laughs> have like, like, we had very trained staff and they call camera or they call police we, so we usually try to deal with it before the case. So to expand on that, just so our our training of our staff does yeah. include de-escalation training, trauma counseling, all sorts of training where we try to handle situations where if there's some kind of you know argument or or conflict in shelter, we're able to de-escalate and handle it. And we would have, especially if we have 20 beds, at least two staff on it all times. Right now we have one staff on all the on Nicole and I on the ball. Um, but to answer your question, we have not thought about this. We created an increase about the, the the money that it would cost to taxpayers. I I can't say that we would do an increase. I think if anything, um, you know, maybe having our services in the area for people who are currently um, using drugs in the, in the area but aren't homeless, or you know, maybe they're having access to a space where, <coughs> uh, regardless of their um, status of using, would help. <laughs> Maybe you know, it's like a, like if they're housed and they're it's in possible. and um, there's a, there's an access to services that can help them um, get out of that pattern. Hopefully, that'll help maybe reduce it. Um, but for the amount of calls that we get normally in our shelter, it's not a ton we get right now currently. But we could. I I want to hear all this, so it's not like I'm. <laughs> You know, this is good for me to hear, and it's, if it's something I need to look into, then I definitely will. Um, Mark has Mark is here, so you can see hey, him. Mark. I think we can see you. Mark, go ahead. Hey. You can't hear him. Did you keep him? Oh, uh, I didn't. I unmuted him. Must be unmuted himself. <coughs> Muscle. Can I ask a quick question while, while he's um, trying to act, be accessed? Uh, would, your, um, would your entity end up paying any property taxes or are you strictly on top of we, we pay property taxes. So the Memorial, the Memorial Housing Partnership the board has the developer and the owner long term. So, for instance, if uh, you don't need the shelter anymore. We can convert it into housing or whatever the need would be. Um, and we, our, all our properties pay property tax, usually more than what it was when, before we started. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mark. Yeah. It looks like it. Yeah, you did. Okay, next time I unmute, you don't remute yourself. <laughs> teach an old dog new tricks. You still okay, pop up. Okay, how about now? Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, actually, Duncan asked my question, but I'm still um, I'm curious as to um, do they have a location? Is it whom it's going to be in the village? Is it going to be? Do they have any ideas of whereabouts in the village? They want village water and sewer, I assume. Yeah, we, we do not have a location right now, Mark. This is really concerning because I'm looking into here and here and back there. Um, however, you were correct we, to do any kind of multifamily like this or we want to own it long term, we'd be looking for access to, to water and sewer. Uh, we don't want to be in the flood zone because I won't like that either. Um, there's lots of things like that that we have to deal with. Um, if it's a shelter, we want to make sure it's an appropriate location to begin with. Um, 
you want water in Surrey and you don't want a flood zone. I said, pick the wrong town. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we, we need to be able to at least pass that hurdle. Yeah. Anything else, Mark? Let me go back on you. Yep. Okay, so you move yourself again, Mark. He's good. Would this be new construction? Depends on what we find. So if we found an appropriate building um, that we could rehab, that would work. If it was an empty lot that we could develop, that would work. Thank you. Okay, we're like way over. So this is the first of many conversations, I assume. Yeah. Uh, Paul, if I open it up to you, everyone is going to raise their hand. Is it? Will there be an opportunity? We'll have. Let's do this. Let's invite you back because you're just you're just starting discussions. It sounds like. Yeah, we wanted to, as Kim said, really wanted to just broach the subject. Have you know that we're looking into this? He was working with Janice Brown's already, and then this came up, so we're trying to just work together. I'm going to be very bold so, here, so you get, can totally just shut me down. I'm very okay with that. But maybe we should have um, a special meeting very specifically about this and make it more of a town hall yeah. and allow you know, residents to ask questions. Yeah, that's one of the things that we've talked about on our team is just having even like ongoing, especially once we do find a site, if we do happen to have a site in Johnson, um, or the leading up to that, you know, just having those community discussions where it's very open and transparent, ask your questions, if I don't have an answer, I'll write it down, I'll have a bridge for next slide, hopefully. <laughs> um, I wrote my research I'm gonna do about your question. Um, you know, that kind of ongoing conversation where we can really hear people's concerns, but we don't want to push people away, we want to hear it. Let's do this. Let's take the action of we are happy to organize the first one, and then you could kick off if you want to have like a Lamoille County thing. If you wanted to kick it off from there, that would be excellent. Mm -hmm. But we'd be happy to kick off a Johnson specific if you wanted to work with Brian, and we can figure out a mutual date that's appropriate and make it a public. That'd be great. Yeah. We do that. Yeah. Cool. Thank okay. you for listening. And yeah, thank you. Sorry. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Brian. So uh, next up, we have uh, Ronnie and Sandra Dixon. Uh, we want to give a little update on what's happening at the property on uh, River Road, and uh, they wanted kind of an opportunity to put pages to a name and, and introduce themselves to the board. So, uh, why don't we start with introductions? And I'm Ron Dixon. Hi, Ron. Uh, I'll see you. We, 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 like. <laughs> we bought River Road East uh, 2066, so January 28th of 21. From Jim Armstrong. Mm -hmm. We attempted to clean up the yard last year. We got threatened with firearms and a bunch of other stuff. And so we decided just to let it Thank go you. until they moved up. Harry, my mother, and she's kind of said we stole the property. If you look at the bottom of that paper, you'll see a legit bill of sale where we actually bought it from Jim. Um, Jim knew that myself and Sandy would clean it up, but she had tried to get Harriet to participate for a very long time, I guess. Haven't seen me in more than 24 years. But we do have plans. We've actually made quite the headway. It's moved about five ton of trash right now. Might not look it, but it does. Um, I have to wait for, I have filed a civil suit to remove the big items because you can't just throw the little stuff out. I have to take the legal channels. Yeah. And so we're waiting on a camper that's in, I guess, the Eldridge right of way. And the lucky bin, the other camper and the mobile home and whatever else that might be of value. The trash, we are we have done household trash, which we found more. 
And I know it's a big project, but you'll find out that if, you know, we've heard rumors that the town was going to take our property and really monitor our land, mm -hmm. you're going to find out that we're going to do the right thing all the way through. We kind of got to stop the property. Even yesterday, we had a front door kitchen, so mm -hmm. it's been a fun thing out there. I mean, I'll just speak for the board for a minute, if you guys don't mind. Uh, I really appreciate you coming in and introducing yourselves. Um, I have talked to Brian a little bit just in prep for today. And as far as the town is concerned, like that's your property. You right. own it. We have the deed that says you own it. So we very much uh, agree with that. And we also, I'll just say, I'll speak on behalf of everyone. So I am confident it's true. We very much appreciate the cleanup efforts and very much want to encourage that to continue. Um, we have a dump trailer. You'll see it parked in front of the pile every Friday night. Walks the guy work for it. I don't sit around all day. <laughs> so I get to work till eight o'clock on the trash pile. And as I told Brian, anybody's actually welcome to drive out and watch it disappear. And hopefully, but it's not just the surface trash. We actually realized that we bought it that we buried trash. So the project's probably going to get bigger and bigger over time, but we want to remove it all. Yeah. Okay. That's great. That's nice great. to meet you all. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank Is you. Is your long term plan to uh, to have a home there? There will be no home there ever again. Yeah. That we can help you because the trash that they bury, you got to realize that Brian McCall, the EPA guy that was working with me. He told me that they buried so much trash here that when we're done removing the trash, there probably will be just a big hole. And let's do it right and clean up our environment. And I'm sure everybody wants that. So you're working with the BPA, it sounds like now. So um, yeah. we, at first we were, I don't know, always voicing our opinions rudely to each other. But I, we're actually including some guy, D man, spoke to the county health. Right there. Hey, Ron. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> he actually agreed that it's a big project and it didn't start yesterday. Yeah. Right? I'd really like to see it gone. Um, anybody that actually wanted to know about me and Sammy would find out that we came from a park that misses us because we work. Yeah. And we like to be quiet. So we're hoping our neighbors like us. Hopefully Harriet doesn't want to come back. You know, nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you. Yeah. I'm sure I'll be seeing you after. Oh yeah. Okay. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much for coming in. It's great to meet you. Put a face to a name, and we very much appreciate the cleanup effort. And you can actually see us and know who we are. <laughs> oh, wait. Yes. Thank can you. I just say something yeah. here. I, I've been on the slip board for many years, and I think we've been dealing with that property for ten years. Longer. Maybe longer. Uh, and this is the most promising I've ever seen with that property. We really like living there. I lived here 40 years ago. I got married. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. 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 Thank uh, next up, we have a uh, request for noise permit from Field Day. Uh, I don't actually have a permit for you to sign. Is it, is that the same? Is it the same as last year? Yeah. A motion to approve the noise permit for second. Field Day's authorizing Brian to sign. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? That was a, that was a premature second. Thank you. It's all oh, I'm good. I'm still good. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we are, you're wasting time by talking about this. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Me. Mark said aye. Unanimous. All right. Uh, next up, we have the uh, sewer permit for 120 Clara Row. Uh, the village has approved the permit on the condition uh, that the town also approved it. Motion to approve uh, sewer <laughs> permit. You have the map for sure where it's located. It's not, it's a little hard to read. 
hard to see. Uh, I could not find a good copy of the map. But the town of Shore service area extends to 120 Sinclair Road. They are the last property inside the sewer district. Uh, it covers their entire property. Um, actually, this is 100 C. This is Sinclair. This is 120. So before we, uh, the, there was a building that had a hookup there. Uh, that building has been demolished, but this is this is this is a new hookup for a new building in a location where there was a building that was hooked up. The Troy's No, he's saying he that. says they're giving credit for one that was hooked up. They wanted to put uh, two tiny homes onto this lot. And Troy in here is saying that they're not going to get credit for both. This permit application is for one building. So if they want to do a second building, they'll come back. Yes. Well, the permit application is, it two? is for two single family homes. It is. Right, 210 gallons a day times two. Go ahead, Mark. I, um, Brian, I thought the sewer went up the road to the next house after, the, after this one. That's my impression. And do we have any concern about where they get their water from? I know the existing house that was there didn't have water or it had a dry spring. I, that probably isn't any purview of ours, but I think the house right above this, I don't know if they had a sewer look hooked up, but I talked to the guy actually that where the barn is and above it, don't know his name, a while back. And I'm pretty sure he was saying they used a spring. Okay. And the Cohen's are the next people up the road, not, not, um, not the one behind, behind these folks, but the next, the I next stand behind. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think this property is the last one in the sewer district. Yeah, I don't think so either. Yes, it may not, may or may not be the last property now, but on the, on actually it wasn't this map. It was uh, there's a printed map hung on it on the wall in the village manager's office. Uh, that's a little bit easier to read. That goes up to one point. We should have down big, huge printed maps on our walls. What's that? Should have. I'm pretty yeah, sure. Well, I couldn't, I couldn't find a. This is the best quality map I could find an electronic copy of. So we don't have a good printable. Is, map. is there a plan on denying this if it's the last house or second to last house? I don't think it makes a difference. Uh, okay, we have there... a motion. Did you have a motion? Yeah. Okay, wait, what's that again? Let's see it. And is, is this not, is this for one house or two houses? It is for two houses. That's my mistake. I, I, I don't think we're hooking up one at a time, but it, it is for two houses. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Wait, don't, no more discussion. Do we have a second? Wait back at the beginning of the discussion, Evan, we have a question. More than there was a second. Do you want to second it, Duncan? Oh, no. Wait, I got, I that was the other. That was the last motion. At the point of clarification, this two is the number of bedrooms. I don't think that is single family. Home. Can we have this discussion after we get a second? Is anyone not going to second oh, this? I'll second. Just okay, we have a second now. Discussion. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, this Eric application would look like single family home and the number of bedrooms single. Family. It's two, and it's a 420 allocation. They're allowing three, uh, 210. It's, it's the village permit. Yeah. And they already approved it. Well, well approved. I guess the point is this is for one unit, and oh. they'll have to come back to us in a second. Okay. I was <laughs> reading that wrong. I think so. So I guess I was right the first time. This is for one. Okay. So to, to that, 
question. We, according to our ordinance, and I doubt this has been done, but I think it probably should be done. The town sewer service ordinance is, um, we are supposed to deduct the total number of gallons per day issued under these permits from 25,000 gallons. Um, and annually, the select board is supposed to request of, this, of the trustees what remains of that allocation. Number one, I think we should, it's not essential to whether or not we approve this permit or not, so I think we should do that, Brian. We should find out how much of the original 25,000 gallons we actually have left. So I, I'd like to, I don't know what we need to do to ask Brian to do that. Do we need to formally ask Brian to do that? Or can Brian just do that and report back to us? Well, is there a consensus? Do we want to do that? Yeah, because we don't know right now. We talked about that last year when we approved this or on yeah. Connection on Sinclair, but we said that there was a boatload left to the allocation. I think there it is, and I don't remember what it is. The boatload is great. I'd like to know how much in gallons. Yeah, I don't know what it is. In I don't know. A boatload's a metric is. measurement. I don't know what a boatload is. I really don't. Sorry. Um, it's not an unreasonable request of no. the village to ask them to identify how much is left. Um, because it, whatever we permit out of this comes out of our original 25,000 gallons. And that 25,000 gallons may be important when we start talking, if we ever do, start talking about allocation to, this, to the industrial or business park. So, so would, we have a, would we have a uh, allowance that we would add as a contingency or no? You just want to know before we make any decision, or can we do it based on a contingency, so we don't have to bring it back to the board. Well, I suspect that 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 Evan is right that that there's a boatload left, and it's going to be a non-issue. I'd just like to know. Okay, can we what it is? Can we have? You just want to know what it is. Is that going to change our motion at all? I don't think so. But but one question I do have is: Did we get so, any fee for this permit? We have not been. And the second thing that does relate to allocation is if the village is going to, they're giving the, the applicant credit for 210 gallons because the original property was hooked up to the village system. So they're asking for an additional 210 for a total of 420. So my question directly for this permit would be, are they going to deduct 420 from our 25,000 gallons of capacity, or are they going to deduct 210 from our capacity? Could only be 210. I would expect it to be, but it doesn't hurt for us to make sure that that's the case. Well, then we should, I think we should specify that it's our expectation that only 210 be deducted. Because the permit, if you look at the permit, it actually says 420. So, right on the bottom here, 420. I think that's because they're, they're giving them credit for 210 and they're getting an additional new 210. Well, all right, so yep. it's 210 per bedroom and there's two bedrooms. So it adds up to 420. So I will. It's two units. I would like to amend my motion. Approve uh, motion to approve as long as the village only deducts 210 gallons a day from the town's allotment. And I have one, an additional 200. Yeah, an additional 210. Is that a friendly amendment, Eric? Yes. Did you get that, Donna? <laughs> you were. Is it friendly? Yeah, it's friendly. <laughs> only because we're sharing a table. Good. You have to do that more often. So we're approving 210. Yes. An additional 210. Which which we should receive a $75 permit fee for Brian. I'll talk to Rosemary and talk to I guess Troy and Sandy on this one. Make sure the thing gets conveyed to us. My final comment is wait, wait, this wait. is backwards. Yeah. Wait, Mark gets a comment before you get a comment. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> so in the end, 
we're approving two separate buildings on this lot, adding 210 more gallons a day, probably four bedroom, two, two separate houses is what is what we're voting on right at the moment. Am I clear on that? Which is, that's all I want to know. I believe so. It's my understanding. I don't Thank think we're really. Yeah, sure. You know, you're not counting bedrooms. The water room, 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 water the town first because they're in the town. That's what you're yeah. yeah, the ordinance specifies that they, you know, like timing wise, I can understand, I guess, why they did it, but really for future references. These ought to come to the town first. It's in the town to a third period, and then the third one proceeds after. I let the village that's what there. they're doing. That Troy is advising them that they have to go to the town first, then they go to the village and get preliminary approval, then they go to the state, and then they come back and get village uh, final. Approval. Look at the actual permit, it's signed by. Four or five members of the trustees oh, <laughs> under the preliminary approval section. It's been approved. The preliminary has been approved. Oh, you're right. Can we give that? Can you? Do you mind making a note to give that feedback, Ryan? I will. Um, Jen, did you want to say something? Okay. You're welcome. Um, okay. So we have a motion. We have a second. Donna's clear as mud over <laughs> there. Um, are we ready to vote? Okay, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, we have ayes, unanimous. Good to go. Okay, next up. Uh, first, I'll say, Jason, I think we're all set to let it in here. Why are you going to be all set? Bye, Jason. Sorry. Thank you for your waiting. Are sure you all want to stay? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk about rail trail. Um, next up is planning commission. And then just a reminder that we do have a hard stop at 835 to um, switch gears. But planning commission. Um, so uh, there is a, uh, I, I'm willing to continue service on the Model County Planning Commission, but we, there is a form that needs to be um, filled out and sent back to LCPC to codify that, which requires a vote of this board, if, if the board is okay the, with that. You're the only rep for the town and the right. for the village. Right? Yeah, there is one, there is, Diane LaHulier is for the village, I am for the town. I make a motion we uh, submit Duncan's name to the LCPC board. And you yep. can do that for one, two or three years, right? Yes, that's right. Oh, three years. Okay. What's your choice? Three years. Right. Beth, you can second. You can <laughs> second that one. It may or may not be a It'll be interesting. Years, but, you know. Okay, I'll second that one. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be interesting to see uh, how that plays out. Okay. <laughs> Let's not discuss this one, shall we? I am interested to see how you vote, though. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna abstain. <laughs> okay. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And mark is aye also. And I abstain. And yeah. Okay, that was fun. Great. All right. Uh, next up, we have uh, the Luxury Building Inspection Report form. So I've made a couple of the suggested or requested changes on uh, the inspection report form. Uh, in particular, added. A uh, distinction between the date notice sent and the date notice uh, the date the notice was received. I would move to accept the changes. That that? Have been made. I would move to accept the changes that have been made. We have a motion to a second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And ayes have it. Yeah. Is it I, yeah. uh, I think we do. I've been talking to our health officers about getting a plan together so that uh, all of us will go out and do the first one together so that we've got an opportunity to kind of see how it works. 
Um, we also have a pending list of at least two complaints, possibly more, that are headed our way. Did you get a response to that? Uh, not yet. Okay. Uh, you but yeah, I'm, I'm planning on starting this with uh, probably the new receipts complaint for first, and we'll revisit the topic about how to select properties. Ryan, was this um, ordinance reviewed by a municipal attorney before it was adopted? Yeah, numerous times. Yeah, uh, it was not reviewed by our current attorney, uh, but it has been reviewed by the town's former attorney a number of times. Also, an attorney on the board, it was quite a bit of back and forth between attorneys. Yeah, I, 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 I emailed Brian that I still have a concern about the enforcement provisions and whether or not they're totally in sync with each other. Um, and I think that's, I guess we'll we'll go through it when we have a test case. Do we want to send it to the attorney to question that specific item? I wouldn't imagine it would take long for our attorney to respond. I don't expect so. Uh, I can let me fill in a little bit about the conversation that Duncan and I had. There, there's a, a few places where the ordinance could probably be a little bit more clear. The particular, uh, if you recall, the intention of, of the way that it was supposed to work was that we would, the town would receive a report, conduct an, inspect, an inspection, then the inspection report would come back to the select board. Select board would hold a hearing, determine you know, whether the case had merit or not, whether they believe it was a dilapidated or nuisance building. If that was the case, the property owner would have an opportunity to, to submit a plan of corrective action. Select board could either accept that, amend that, or make their own plan. For corrective action and enforce that on the uh, property. Yeah, the intention was that you get the property owner would develop a plan and we would hold them to the plan that they had developed. But there is a provision in there. If the town thinks the plan is going to move too slowly or uh, is it going to seriously correct the problem? Penalties start to accrue if at any point the property owner fails to comply with the plan. Whether the plan is imposed by the select board or the plan that they volunteer, penalties start when, when a plan has been presented. So that's after the hearing uh, and after the property owner has a, an opportunity to submit their own plan for corrective action. Uh, one of the areas that I was kind of most concerned about was in the description of uh, providing notice to a property owner. We make reference to a state statute that has to do with serving notice uh, for tax sale. I think that we meant to model our process on the one use for tax sale. Um, but it's it's a little unclear why we're why we're referencing that. We're refer referencing a statute at all. Yeah. Yeah, we're referencing the statute that really is not applicable. I don't think it undermines anything in a practical sense, but it it, it, it is a, uh, I think it's more of a cosmetic defect than a material defect, but it is, it is not appropriate to have referenced that particular statute in that way. So do we feel like we need legal review? So I, I, I totally understood what, what Brian was saying. My concern is that the ordinance really envisions what I consider to be two separate statutory procedures for, for enforcing 
uh, you know, one section of the statute talks about filing liens and um, securing, um, you know, filing uh, in the court for remediation and the full costs and all that. And another section refers to first offense, second offense, third offense. And I don't think you can do both. I think you have to do one or the other. And my concern is, are these are those separate provisions of statute mutually exclusive? And I think we need to know that. If, if we start issuing fines, then I don't think we can seek the other remedies that are available to us under the ordinance. Conversely, if we start you know, using the, the other provisions that are available to us, I don't think we can apply the first second. You know, I think right. that's I'm the question sure I want to get answered. Like yeah. And not, yeah. Right. I think I understand your question better now, hearing it rather than reading it. Okay, so it sounds like we need clarification on that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we could use clarification on that. I, I, now I understand your question better, and I did not prepare to answer that question. Okay, so you'll take that? Yep. Um, the, Thanks, is the, I'll see if I can answer it on my own, but I suspect I'm probably going to have to send it to the town attorney for review. Don't spend time on it. You should just answer it to them. We're going to ask them to look at it anyway. There's no point in you. So just send it to the town attorney and ask them for I yeah. think so. Just ask, okay. can we collect both of these fees? If you have any, or do we have to select one or the other? If you have any further questions, Brian, just get in touch with me. Okay. Oh, okay. So, um, since we only have a couple of minutes, the job descriptions are not going to be quite as quick. Um, I have just proposed that we move the regional assessor update um, up and do that now, Richard. I can do that in a minute or less. Perfect. Um, the um, uh, at the executive committee level, the executive committee reviewed the concept. Um, they were uh, a bunch of questions, but at the end of the day, they decided to move the question to the full board with their support for the concept. So yeah, you know the the idea of entering into a service agreement. With us, CPC will be brought to the full board at their next next board meeting. And Ron, myself, Sasha, and some other representatives were supposed to meet and try and put some meat on the bones. Good. Okay. Thank you. Did you follow that, Mark? Good. Okay. I am checking to see if you're sleeping over there. <laughs> <laughs> next up Did, is the yeah. Oops, sorry. Rail trail mowing. No, I was going to say the job descriptions. I guess we could do the rec trail one. We should do the manager. Yeah, I think the rec yeah, coordinator sure. could be a pretty quick one out of that. And Let's I, do rail trail real quick. Okay. So, uh, rail trail mowing, we have, I've been in contact with a uh, representative from the state who is now the person in charge. Like Janice, I think is her name. Uh, but anyway, the, we've been in touch with them. We've requested a uh, a permit. We haven't received it back yet, but I'm expecting I'm not expecting any hurdles of, on that. I, don't probably, I am expecting us to receive a permit to mow on the rail trail next couple of days, right around the corner. Then we'll send the crew out uh, kind of as soon as they're available. Does a permit, getting a permit, provide any protection? It does not. Uh, I did ask your question if they would provide us with a whole harmless agreement, and they will not. I would almost rather hire that out than have our town crew and our equipment on a right of way that we do not own and we're maintaining um, for recreational purposes, uh, but. At least if we hired it out, we could treat all the other recreational right-of-ways that we don't own the same. We could spend the same amount on the long trail, the same amount with a Green Mountain ATV club, and it would be equal, same amount with bass. And that way we're paying the same amount for all these recreational right-of-ways that we don't own, and we're treating them all. Yeah. It, 
I'll say another point in favor of contracting it out. Uh, our mowing deck does not fit on a couple of the rail trail bridges. Uh, so there's a couple bridges that we have to decamp and drive around the bridge and pick up the trail again on the other side, uh, which doesn't add a massive amount of time, but it definitely adds time because I would not call it time loss. Guess I just want to get the trails mowed. I guess the rest of the board did not hear the, the remainder of what I said. Or we'll treat all outdoor recreational right of the same in this town. And whatever we spend on the rail trail, we're going to spend with the Green Mountain Club on the long trail. We're going to spend that with Vast as well. What are you talking about? Well, Why well, did this we're so maintaining good. right of ways that we don't own, that we don't do for any other recreational activity. We need to treat all of these organizations fair. This is a whole different topic. This is not about mowing the rail trail, which is what our topic is. I think is. it is, because if we don't mow the rail trail, it would be fair with all the other ones that we are don't maintain our non right away. Does that not tie together? I, I don't understand what you're trying to say. And I I'm saying I would, rather con have I would rather contract it so that <clears throat> we're not liable. As That's a town, a different point. Well, I wouldn't wouldn't and liable. I would like to treat all recreational right of ways in this town equally. If we're going to be maintaining a right of way that we don't own, you're talking about mowing the, the long trail? I'm, I'm saying because we're putting money from the taxpayers into a right of way that we do not own for recreation, that we should do the same for all the other recreational clubs that have right of ways in this town. So a vast, a vast. Uh, we, we should mow. Uh, we should mow vast. We should mow vast, uh, vast, and the rail trail. <laughs> and we could either write checks to all the organizations, or we could maintain their right of ways with contracts. Okay, let's not. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make a motion, Madam Chair. Sure. My motion would be that we, if we do not hear from the state by the end of this week, that we. Go ahead and mow the trail anyway. Which trail are you referring to? I am referring to our the section of the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail, which goes through Johnson. And you yeah. want our town crew to mow it, or you yes. want to hire it? I do not want to hire it. I don't know that we have any money in the budget to hire it. And we do have the capacity to do it. OK, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Yes. And Mark seconds. Any discussion? I would make a friendly amendment that the, uh, the town crew would mow it at their earliest convenience. We don't even have all the roadsides mowed yet. And and the reason I'm saying that is because I know. Jason has told us that they try to time it with rain and they could be out there mowing today, I guess, but um, because of safety, they, they don't want to go out when there's a high traffic on the trail. So I, I would make a friendly amendment. It, it would be a friendly amendment. I don't think my motion precludes them from doing it at the earliest convenience, but I'm perfectly amenable to that being part of my motion. Mark? I accept that. Okay. I would entertain another friendly amendment. You can laugh if you want. But if we're going to be maintaining this, they can keep track of their hours and we can send a bill to the state. <laughs> laugh all you want. They don't have to well, accept it. Well, yeah, I, I won't accept that because only because I'm, I, I think we could do that and probably should do that. And you can make that as a separate motion and I'll vote for it. <laughs> okay, we have a motion There's and no we have point. a second. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those aye. opposed? Nay. Okay. What is your vote, Duncan? Aye. Mark? Aye. Aye. Nay. Okay, 
we have another motion? There's no point. Okay. I didn't vote for that motion. Okay, next item is we need to go into executive session. So. We do. We do. Um, you can do that if you'd like. It's going to be a Zoom if you wanted, actually. Um, we'll do you uh, uh, okay. Okay. You can, you're welcome to hang out. Yes, yeah, by all means, hang out. Yes, yeah, please. It's going to be a little while. I think you can just, can you just motion to enter it to executive session? Yeah, we don't need two motions. Okay, okay. that sounds good. I, oh, I motion to enter into executive session for recreation coordinator position interviews as allowed by 1 BSA 313 A1. Oh. <laughs> what? A3? Yeah, A3. Um, may I suggest we invite Casey and um, Jen Uris, Casey Romero and Jen Uris, if they, she's not coming over. And invite Brian. Casey and Brian, yeah. I like it. Okay, we have a motion. Second. We have a second. Who was the second? Jackson's the second. Um, <laughs> I'd be a little faster. <laughs> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Okay. All those opposed, ayes have it. Okay, anybody who is on Zoom, you're going to go into a waiting room.